This is the clearest film ever shot of a real unidentified flying object. 68,000 UFO reports have been filed in this country alone. Skeptics, however, pose an important question. If flying saucers are so common, why haven't we captured one? In a remote New Mexico desert, researchers have discovered a startling answer to that question. A persistent rumor holds that the United States government has recovered and is concealing fragments of alien spacecraft. Fragments and more. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Charges of a UFO cover-up began almost with the first famous flying saucer sightings in late June 1947. It's curious. These reports seem to center around areas where atom bombs and rockets were tested. Were alien forces keeping watch on the new weapons we savages had invented? The flying disks became the Pentagon's nightmare. Seemingly, our fastest jets could never come close to their incredible speeds and right-angle turns. UFOs were said to be able to shut down guided missiles by remote control. The Air Force organized Project Blue Book to officially investigate UFOs. Since its termination in 1969, Blue Book has been alternately praised and damned. Well, the Air Force position is that we investigated UFOs for 22 years, over 12,000 sightings. Colonel Don Burgrave, U.S. Air Force. About 95% of all the UFOs were explainable. They were weather phenomenon, they were balloons, they were airplanes, they were lightning. And we concluded as a result of our investigation, which was carried out very scientifically, that one, there was no threat to the security of the United States, and there was no evidence that we could ever locate that an extraterrestrial vehicle had landed here. New York lawyer Peter Gersten sued the CIA and FBI to release 5,000 UFO-related documents. The reading of all the documents reveals that UFOs have the ability to render inoperable present-day technology. UFOs have the ability uh, to gain access uh, to our most sensitive military installations, unrestrictive and unlimited access uh, to nuclear installations. There's no doubt about it in my mind that there's a government UFO cover-up. Ray Fowler, civilian UFO researcher for 17 years. I've talked to military people who have told me about government cover-ups, how they've been instructed to say this and to say that. And uh, I worked for the United States Air Force Security Service myself, and uh, which worked for the National Security Agency. And I'm very familiar with intelligence operations and cover stories and things like that. So there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, that there is a cover-up. If it was a planned cover-up, then uh, they were very successful in keeping it from me. Colonel Robert Friend, former head of Project Blue Book, Actually, now an engineer on the space shuttle. A lot of these organizations uh, decided that there was a cover-up because the Air Force didn't pursue these uh, sightings to what they considered uh, the ultimate conclusion. If there has been a UFO cover-up, it began in Roswell, New Mexico. Near White Sands and Alamogordo, Roswell was home base for many early tests of atom bombs and guided missiles. Here, also, the practice of military stonewalling may have been perpetrated. 
The case began when Roswell businessman Dan Wilmot witnessed an amazing object over the town. His son tells the story. This was their home in July of 1947, and it was one summer evening they were sitting out here. Dad looked up in the west and saw an object that came down and had lights blinking, and it was rather frightening to him, but he said all of a sudden it seemed to rock a little bit and sort of counterbalanced itself, wiggle a little bit, and then seemed to settle down and take off at a rapid rate of speed. The next day, reporters heard that the Air Force had found fragments of the mystery object crashed on a remote ranch northwest of Roswell. Excitement ran high until officials announced it was only a weather balloon. Major Jesse Marcel, in charge of the operation, now tells a far different story. They took pictures, of course. They had a whole flock of microphones there. They wanted me to, to they wanted some comments from me, but I wasn't at liberty to do that. So all I could do is keep my mouth shut. And General Ramey is the one who discussed, or uh, told the, the, the newspapers, I mean the newsmen, what it was, and to forget about it. It was nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, which we, we both knew differently. Major Marcel had to keep silent because of his strategic position at that time. He was in charge of all security and intelligence on atomic tests in the United States and the Pacific. Marcel retraced his secret recovery operation across the hot New Mexico desert. We left uh, Roswell perhaps around 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. As you can see, it's, it's flat. It is very difficult. In fact, uh, with just verbal directions, we never would have found it. We had to follow the rancher out there. The crash site was so remote, it took an entire day to drive there. The following morning, we went out to the site where the crash was. And uh, what I saw, I couldn't believe there was so much of it. It was scattered over such a vast area. So we proceeded to pick up as much of the debris as we could, loaded in the wagon. We filled that up. It took us a good part of the day to do that, because uh, there were such small fragments that we had to do a lot of picking. We found a piece of metal uh, about a, far, a foot and a half to two feet wide and about, about two or three feet long. Felt like you had nothing in your hands. It wasn't any thicker than the foil out of a pack of cigarettes. But the, the thing about it that got me is that you couldn't even bend it. You couldn't bend it. Even with a sledgehammer would bounce off of it. So I knew that I had never seen anything like that before. And as of, as of now, I don't know what it was. There is new evidence that the FBI then got into the case with a different cover story. Lawyer Peter Gersten, searching through declassified government documents, came across a mention of the Roswell case. One of those documents related to an incident in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, which indicated that the object which had crashed was an experimental kite. Uh, the FBI investigated the incident and determined that it was terrestrial, that it was from uh, an organization which had been doing research in, in experimental kites. What did crash in this desert? A UFO? A weather balloon? A radar reflecting kite? It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of. Because I was, being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all the materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This was nothing like that. It could not be. It, it could not have been. To develop the first atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project was our first totally secret military operation. Secrecy has continued to this day as an instrument of foreign policy. Official fabrications have become a vital link in security. We never admitted such a spy plane as our U-2 existed, until the Russians managed to shoot one from their skies. We managed to capture an advanced enemy aircraft even fragments can reveal new information. Such captured material is routinely rushed to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton to the top secret foreign technology division. This place is so classified
that former Air Force General, Senator Barry Goldwater, was once denied entrance. For 30 years, rumors have spread about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. According to the stories, the U.S. government is concealing, under top security, flying saucers from another world and alien bodies, cryogenically suspended in huge freezers. Such rumors could be easily dismissed, except that UFO researchers have gathered information leaked from military sources, sources who claim to have seen the craft and the bodies. The stories and rumors all mention a mysterious Hangar 18 as the ultimate repository. In search of cameras were the first allowed to photograph inside this hangar. Is it possible that here in Hangar 18, highly secret activities once took place? What evidence of a cover-up might we hope to find? Wright-Patterson is one of the largest and most complex air bases in the world. In the Foreign Technology Division alone, hundreds of secret experiments have been undertaken. Continuing military security has made Hangar 18 a mysterious citadel. Some experts believe that new designs have been created here. Every branch of the military has experimented with flying wedges, flying wings, hovercraft, with an amazingly consistent lack of results. The flying saucer shape was an obsession of aeronautical pioneer Edmund Doak. These rare films show static and dynamic tests of his early models. Doak spent 30 years and a third of a million dollars investigating the problems of circular airfoils. Ironically, just when he seemed on the verge of a breakthrough with his Doak 16 vertical takeoff plane, the Air Force canceled development on his projects. No reason was ever given. NASA tested the H2F2 lifting body as a prototype for the space shuttle. As with all flying wedges, lack of stability was the single unsolvable problem. unable to confirm a single successful test of a manned flying saucer. Yet, the effort continues. Why? Does the government have some reason to pursue this quest? A reason they are keeping secret? From Wenham, a suburb of Boston, comes an eyewitness account which could explain this continued military fascination with flying saucers. Ray Fowler, one of the most respected civilian UFO investigators is also author of two bestsellers in the field. Because of his stint in the Air Force Security Service, he finds himself still vulnerable to government pressure. I work for a company that uh, designed and built a, a major weapon system. And because of connections within the company, because of connections with Dr. Jalen Hynek, who was an Air Force investigator for, for many years, uh, I came across information that indicated that this major weapon system, as well as others, had been disrupted by UFOs. And uh, I gave a story to a national newspaper, the Christian Science Monitor, uh, which published this story. Uh, within an hour after this particular paper was out, the Strategic Air Command had called my company. And the following day, the Pentagon called the company and threatened to send a letter of displeasure to the company if uh, something wasn't done about my uh, making these things public. Because of similar pressures in his own work, a friend of Ray's had kept quiet for 27 years with an amazing story. Ray tried to convince the friend to tell his story on In Search Of. I know it's been several days now and I've been waiting for you to call me on this, but uh, have you come to any conclusions? The man finally agreed, for the first time, to talk, but only under strict conditions. Uh, I can assure you that uh, your name will not be used. They made up a name, Fritz, to protect the witness's true identity. And I think the best place to do it probably would be my planetarium away from the kids and the telephone and things like that. Waiting for his friend to arrive, Ray nervously fiddled with his telescopes. 
He remembered his extensive investigations into the man's reliability as a witness. In the case of Fritz, I started in 1973, went all the way back through the various companies he worked for, right back to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, talked to people he worked with, and they all gave him a very clean build of health, a reputable man, honest man, not the type that would uh, fabricate a hoax, and a very efficient uh, engineer manager. As the man arrived, Ray recalled the years his friend had wavered about breaking an oath of secrecy. He recalled their long arguments about a greater public good. Would the years of patient persuasion at last pay off? So I understand it, Fritz. Uh, you were working for the United States Air Force. Uh, the story began late one night in 1953 at Frenchman's Flat, Nevada. The man had been working as a consultant on blast effects of atom bombs when he was suddenly ordered to report for a new mission. What happened after that? We were put on a, um, a bus, which the windows were all completely covered with curtains and in some cases uh, black paper taped to the windows and uh, were driven for three or four hours and we're not sure just where we were going. Uh, several of us tried to uh, guess where we might have been. Uh, we uh, at that time came to the conclusion it was in the area of Kingman, Arizona. After getting off the bus, as recreated here, the scientists were taken to an even more remote location. They had no idea exactly where they were or what they were about to see. We were told that we had been selected for our various technical specialties. And I was told that I was to ask any questions that had to do with dynamic loads and nothing more, and I wouldn't be get any answers to any other questions. It looked like two saucers, I would call it, uh, one on top of the other, inverted probably 25 to 30 feet in diameter. In terms of something known, what kind of metal would it look like? Well, it would look like a brushed aluminum. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it probably wasn't that I say that uh, because I noticed no scratch marks. Mm -hmm. And anything that it would penetrate into the sand 20 inches that way would certainly have some scratch marks. No signs of buckling fracture or anything? Not that I could see. I accepted it was probably some United States government uh, vehicle, a highly classified vehicle. In fact, we were told that that's what it was. Interestingly enough, one of the questions I needed to know was what the mass of the vehicle was. Well, I can tell a lot of things from the penetration into the desert sand and so forth, but I needed to know the mass. And they told me that they weren't going to let me know that. I, I, they perhaps didn't even know themselves. There was also a tent, which... Uh, I didn't get to look into, but if one fellow whom I did happen to talk with briefly until they told us to stop talking, uh, said that he had seen two bodies inside this tent, two alien-looking bodies. It was brown, leathery skin, it had a silver, like a cap on, without a bill. Like a skull cap? Yes, like a skull cap. I realized what this really started to mean, but I also at the same time realized probably why the government was keeping it classified. There are a lot of things that could uh, be changed by our culture or religion. There are a lot of things that could be affected by the release of information like that at that particular time. Like many other UFO stories, this also concludes with the recovered craft taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Cameras are normally prohibited there, but In Search Of was allowed to photograph certain declassified areas. We found there actually are huge freezing chambers inside the legendary Hangar 18. The only knowledge I have of little green men, Martians or whatever, would be from the articles I've read of some of the published uh, novels like Frank Scully's book and things like that. Don Ritter building's manager since 1942, claims the giant freezing cells were never used for storage of alien bodies. Building 18 at Wright-Patterson was used primarily for cold soak engine testing. And we had four cells in this facility that we would uh, take down to minus 65 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, soak the engine for some period of time, and. Uh, make the engine starts to test components, engines, and whatever for cold starts. 
My major criticism is that uh, from way back in the 1947s, there should have been a gradual in information uh, release and uh, have the uh, public uh, accustomed to, to what UFOs are, what we're trying to do about them. Uh, and instead, they've covered up so long that to admit that they've covered it up, it's almost like another Watergate. Um, plus the fact, uh, I think they don't have the answers. And if they admitted even what they knew, people would want to know more answers. They don't have the answers to give them. I'm sure they don't have the answers to give them. Based on my own personal and professional experiences for the last 26 years of wearing this blue suit, and most of that I've been in the public affairs business where I'm responsible for releasing information to the public, I can assure you on behalf of the Air Force that there's just no truth to that at all. Inside the freezing chambers of Hangar 18, we've examined one small clue in the mystery of the UFO cover-up. Whether it proves fact or fiction, this search for flying saucers has already profoundly influenced our perception of our place in the universe. Colonel Robert Friend, former head of Project Blue Book. I believe that speculation and the scientific approach to it can't live together. Uh, I would uh, feel that there were, in uh, lots of instances, cases that had potential scientific pay dirt that possibly should have been pursued further. And in that regard, yes, uh, I think that some of the cases had a lot of promise. The Roswell case and the strange story of the man known as Fritz are two dramatic examples of close encounters of the fourth kind. Like the 68,000 reports on record of UFO sightings, they exist in a limbo, halfway between science and speculation.